And uh, increasingly kind of coming back to the sector as well as somewhat of a, also an asset play. I think it's particularly interesting in a period where we might be entering, um, you know, L, you know, increased inflation. And so a commodity like um, whiskey, which only gets better with age um, and the valuation increases over time um, in an inflationary period that becomes, I think, even more kind of potentially attractive of, of a investment and return um, also as an asset um, on top of being sort of bullish on the category for domestic whiskey, too. I mean, I think, you know, the premiumization trends, I think, out, you know, vodka, which has no flavor, <laughs> um, unless you put some, you know, it in something, I think, you know, the domestic whiskey is the category that's going to continue to outpace, um, you know, other alcoholic beverages. Um, and so I think there's a number of compelling sort of investment characteristics uh, to the category. And so we are increasingly looking at different investment opportunities and uh, you know, these are, are great events to, in terms of trying to meet people and, and learn more what, what's going on and potentially coming across, you know, different. Seeing similar to a comment that was made earlier, you know, um, if you had retail distribution, and this is true in the domestic market, talking to my domestic colleagues, and definitely true around the world, if you had retail distribution, you kind of weathered the storm fairly well. Um, some of my business internationally is retail orientated. Most of my Eastern European business is that way. My Western European business is very on trade. And that came to a screeching halt, obviously, um, up until probably two or three months ago. Um, all of my European importers have at least ordered uh, multiple times now in, over the last three to four months. Um, you know, the UK recently announced its, its next level of, of opening up that kind of starts in April. Uh, opens up a little more in May with the idea of all restaurants and bars being fully open, you know, in, in the UK in, in May, I mean, in June. Um, I've noticed in Asia, um, everybody came back online. China's kind of almost running almost exactly as it was before. So at this point, I've had multiple um, shipments going out that way now at this point, too. So Things are starting to open up on that level, I think, particularly on the on-trade side. And I think if you look at it, um, you know, from that smaller craft perspective where, where um, if you're, a, you're an upstart kind of brand for Europe, I do think that's coming back and will come back in a big way. Certainly, I think the appetite for American whiskey, particularly obviously our indigenous spirit being bourbon, um, is there. There are always a good foundation that has been created over the last decade about that. And I think the, the curiosity and they want to expand upon age statements and all the things we were just talking about recently. Secondary finishing is becoming a big deal and, and proud of the fact that, that our master distiller here at Lux Row has done a lot of great things with secondary finishing. You know, those kind of things are really starting to add uh, curiosity um, and, and consumers, especially higher end consumers, starting to seek that sort of stuff out. So it's coming back. Um, I do feel Europe is opening up and I do feel like that export market is coming back. It sounds like, and I saw this recently this morning, that the tariff is going to go start to go away. I've, I've been saying, I figured by by the summer, I think that we'll, we'll have worked out our issues with, with um, the little the little tariff war that was going on, and that'll be that'll that'll be rescinded too, which would be really good for everybody in the United States. The FET tax was, was reduced from thirteen dollars and fifty cents a proof gallon to two dollars and seventy cents per proof gallon. That's been a huge, made a huge impact in a positive way to startup companies in the industry. I think another thing that's happened, um, certainly because of uh, COVID, it started before, but it's really accelerated since then is the direct-to-consumer channel. We still have a three-tier system in this country that's been led, obviously, and, and, and managed and, and uh, under law by prohibition laws. Each state has their own set of prohibition laws. And we still have the three-tier system, right? So supplier, distributor, uh, retailer. But you've got now a direct-to-consumer. Uh, you've got an active, you know, a captive consumer in the home that's now looking for ways to to buy uh, spirits and cocktails um, and have them delivered to their home. So you've got, you know, software companies like Drizzly was recently bought by Uber. But Paul, I know there's a there's a lot of discussion in terms of. You know, the, 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 obviously the growth, the explosive growth in the retail categories 
Um, but I'm hearing a lot of conflicting information in terms of what's selling. And there's a lot of pressure from the distributors to force price points lower um, to, from smaller producers to meet the bigger producers. You know, I, I've had three conversations this week, unrelated, uh, that all are saying, we got to get the price below $29 because that's what's selling. Uh, are you seeing shifts in, in that, in the, in the products that you're repping? Uh, both directions, really. Uh, super premium. I've got a lot of super premium items I'm representing as well. I've got tequilas that are going for as much as $350 uh, a unit. And then I also have uh, mass uh, production of uh, Russian vodka that is getting down to Smirnoff prices. Uh, a little bit of both. but. During the pandemic, what I've seen the most of is popular priced goods have really. In terms of uh, Irish whiskey and also in terms of gin in the, the, the stores that you're, you're, you're dealing with. Uh, Irish whiskeys are, uh, have grown tremendously uh, over the last 10 year period. But of course, uh, the, the mainstay, Jameson, still controls that market. But uh, um, most of the big companies, as I'm sure uh, Mark can attest to as well, uh, have branched out to try to acquire or start up Irish whiskey brands. Uh, gins are a growing market. I think there's some staleness in vodkas that I think vodka drinkers are looking for bigger, bolder flavor. So I think there are, uh, vodka drinkers are starting to experiment again. Knowing kind of the, the the levels where you see kind of growth in Irish whiskey, or for any of you on the call that have, have kind of a background in this, is it at the kind of premium level or is it at the kind of just above the Jemison level? Um, you know, where would you see the most potential for growth? Premiumization go across every category here in the United States for a number of years, starting with vodka, back when Absolute kind of pushed the price point up on vodka back in the late 80s. And because vodka is a neutral grain spirit, after the global recession, they said, you know what, we don't need a premium, we don't want a premium brand. And I think that's why Tito's did, has done so well. But with aged products, Michael, aged products, including Irish whiskey, American consumers are saying, you know what, uh, we understand the aging process and we look for those brands uh, and are willing to accept and take a higher price point and, and buy at a higher price point. So whether it's American bourbons, American whiskeys, and certainly Irish whiskeys. And I think Robbie said it before, or somebody on the call said it before, yeah, Jameson has been like the, has been the threshold, right? For a number of years, Americans know Jameson whiskey, but they're looking for other brands, especially ones that are unique. And I think the fact you have a peat, you know, you're using peat in some of your products, you know, could give you a point of differentiation that would be interesting to the younger, you know, millennial consumer in the US. Talking about general trends of uh, whiskeys and scotches, and you know, when I when I go to the liquor store, I typically the first thing I look at is the age of a bottle, and I look at it's 12, 15, 18, whatever it is. And I've been seeing over the past couple of years that that the, the trend has been moving away from aged bottles to sort of a blend. For example, you know, you have Lafroy that always had their you know their 18 year bottle. Now they have the Lafroy Lore bottle, and it's a mix of different whiskey. I mean, what's the trend out there? What, where's the market going? Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that. And um, I suppose what has happened is that the the, the producers um, who, you know, the the Lefroigs and the people like that who, who were dealing with with kind of age statement product, um, they they don't have the stocks. Uh, there's been, you know, with, with increased demand for spirits and, and brown spirits, um, there's been pressures on stocks and pressures on age stocks. And, you know, we've seen that in Ireland, particularly uh, here, the, the, you know, up until, um, up until the early, two, up until kind of about 2007, there were, yeah, 2007, there were only three distilleries operating on, on the island of Ireland. So, there was only a certain amount of stock coming out of those and if you want stock that's older than that it, you know it has to have come from Jemison, Bushmills or Cooley and basically uh, you know that that age stock is is limited in terms of what's what's there to go around and likewise in Scotland the same issues have, have arisen and um, where basically and if again if you look at it 
you know, scroll back, you're back to recession times, 2008, 2009. So were companies investing in the stock at that point? Uh, and, and, you know, there was constraints on what was being actually put in the barrel at that, at that stage. So that's what has led to, I suppose, a trend away from age statements. But it's also a qualitative, qualitative thing. So there's a consumer acceptedness that, and, and, and you know, a, 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 a drink specialist um, acceptance that something doesn't necessarily need to be 10 years or 12 years or 18 years old to be good. Um, now, you know, I've tasted some stuff that's been uh, from some US product actually that's that's been aged with uh, curly staves in a barrel uh, for six months, and you know, while it was perfectly drinkable, I I, I wouldn't call it whiskey. Um, but um, you know, so there's somewhere in between. I mean, we brought out product in we launched two products back in. Um, in December or late November, just for the local market, and there were two peated Irish whiskies, and um, they were distilled in 2016, and we launched them in, in 2020. And um, so they were just over four years old, but they were very good. They were the, the spirit was good going into barrel. Uh, we put them in good barrels, and they were they were actually peated whiskies. So peated whiskey can can drink younger anyway, but they were perfectly acceptable, perfectly fine as as whiskey. But, uh, you know, I've tasted whiskies that are five years old, that are pasted with Irish whiskies, and I wouldn't I wouldn't say they're ready yet. Um, you know, so it depends on the product. But, you know, age state, age on the bottle doesn't necessarily indicate um, that, that the product is good. And also, you can have a case with barrels that stuff can be too long in a barrel or too long in a particular barrel, and it just, it, it, it's gone. It's overcooked. Um, regarding the you know, question and to go on uh, what was just said, one of the big brands here in, in America is Wella. Uh, Wella Weeded is very popular. It's sorted after a bourbon. They always put the age statement on the bottles. There's a trend now to where they've stopped doing that. They actually are releasing bottles without that age statement. Um, and so now it's a guessing game, really, what the actual age is. I don't know if there was a financial reason they've done it or a marketing reason. But the age statement, it's not as sought after as it used to be, where people want 15, 20, 27 year old and they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. Um, but there's a lot of brands over here where they're 10 years younger, six years younger, and they're putting out world-class product. Touching on a little bit today is is around you know what brands are doing well and what has how has COVID sort of impacted the industry overall um you know and i can i can give you some perspective on uh from my discussions with the gallo team but also just my my observations from uh from what we're going through with white mckay um gallo has never had a more successful year um than than what uh what you, what they just went through um, you know, the, the on-premise is obviously non-existent, has been shut down for a year at this point. Um, but that entire business has been replaced with retail. Um, and, and retail, uh, it's really amazing, you know, the growth that retail has experienced. Um, and where the growth has really come from is, is in these, uh, what I would call national or known brands. Um, so, you know, the core brands have really exploded. Um, you know, in conversations that I would be having with a Total Wine or with an ABC down in Florida, any of the big buyers from a regional basis uh, that have chain um, chain scale, um, they would basically say, look, if you're not showing uh, at least 30 percent growth um, in retail, you're essentially uh, you're essentially a flat business for us right now. So you need to be exceeding that to be talking to me about. Uh, increased shelf space, increased promotional programming, uh, anything like that. The Gallo team and most of these big national brands, you know, I would throw, you know, any any big beer brand in there, any, uh, uh, you know, any big uh, 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 vodka, you know, Tito's had an enormous year, obviously. Uh, but those national brands succeeded uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, um, uh, e-commerce, direct-to-consumer and e-commerce exploded uh, literally overnight. 
Um, I can tell you that uh, uh, three years ago, when I was with Remy, I was uh, I was leading our our digital and e-commerce sort of evolution, um, and and putting you know year zero through three plans in place, um, and that was very slow to to gain any traction. And in literally a year uh, of COVID, uh, the game has changed overnight. So those known brands. Uh, obviously are the ones that people were searching for and were ordering um, immediately. And then the other piece that really drove national and known brands uh, uh, velocity is that uh, dwell time at retail just dried up. Uh, so no longer did you have people going in there and standing in front of a shelf, learning about different products, uh, potentially doing trade up, which is a lot of what you know, um, Scotch whiskey and specifically white Mackay brands are all about is getting people to trade up from Downmore 12 to Downmore 15, hopefully to, to some other things, you know, non-age statement stuff. Um, but uh, that literally dried up. So we didn't have people standing in front of a shelf. If they were going into a store, they weren't being uh, hand sell sold by somebody on the floor that knew about all these products. So our business, uh, White Mackay actually did fine from a volume perspective where we really struggled and where we continue to struggle is on the profitability and the trade up. Um, and that's a that's a big challenge for the entire industry. Um, so these big brands have gotten much bigger. Uh, value has fallen off a little bit um, because of the reasons that I just said. And then uh, and, and, and but volume has exploded for brands like, you know, the Gallo sort of core portfolio. Um, even even brands like uh, you know uh, our our entry level um, Downmore 12 or Jura 10. Wine and beer, the drinks from restaurants in our platform, and then share those drinks with individuals after they do an in-app purchase, and then the individual receives a a ping on their phone. They download the app. They take the phone back into the restaurant or bar show it to the bar staff who's been trained to know what to do, receive their drink, and then Shared Spirits pays the venue. And our original model was to go to Spirits and Wine Brands and say, hey, we've got this great tool. We can feature your brand and your key accounts menu. You can pay us money. We convert that money compliantly into drink credits that can be dispersed through influencers and ambassadors shared through that network and then properly redeemed and, and tracked. Pretty cool stuff. Well, the reality was the spirits and wine industry at the time we launched told us, hey, our marketing people don't know how to consider that and our legal people don't know how to classify it. So we started doing what they wanted us to do, which is events. What I've seen in the marketplace over the last year, of course, is massive this. All the, the on-premise spending went away for us. There was none there. And they said, hey, we'll still do in-store tastings. This started again in July here in Nashville. And now we're doing significant in-store tasting work uh, for numerous brands, primarily Empire, uh, as a distributor here in Middle Tennessee, Knoxville and Chattanooga starting uh, this month. So our real pivot as we've seen the marketplace respond, is to go directly to restaurants. So our model going forward will be to allow restaurants to leverage our technology, feature cocktails or wine by the glass in our app. They'll pay us marketing dollars. We convert that into drink credits. Those are deployed out through their audience, their chosen big spenders, their chosen bartenders, their chosen GM staff. And those people share those uh, those cocktails and those folks come back into the restaurant to build foot traffic. We find right now in our research and our discussions that it's the restaurant and bars that need help. Um, some of the craft spirits people may vastly disagree with that, but we know our connections are telling us that uh, the restaurants and bars need help getting that traffic back in again. And that's what we're seeing 2021. So sure, can I ask a question? Uh, Absolutely. Are you uh, are you seeing any uh, movement on the uh, cocktails to go with the uh, with this model? We will we will be featuring that front and center. So we're we're hearing from our restaurant partners that they want to feature uh, in the areas where they have to uh, to go meals married with uh, 
the craft or the to-go wine or the to-go cocktail or the to-go beer, whatever's allowed in there. And we're all, I think we're all who have Google Alerts set. We're seeing to-go become semi-permanent in many states now. It's not quite that that way in Tennessee. I'm not hearing that as pressure in, in the Dallas market, for instance, Michael, because things are open up there and you know they're experiencing pretty good crowds in the markets that we're working down there. Not, not, not to I need mean, to move on to the next person, but I do want to make a point, and I'm I'm, I'm thinking of you, Chris uh, Green, since uh, of, of uh, Spirit Legend Spirits USA. I was visiting with Chris yesterday at their uh, distillery up in um, uh, in Cumming, Georgia. And they're, you know, opening a tasting room. And that's obviously a big uh, piece of the action for a lot of the smaller producers is driving that retail direct to this model could work really effectively, you know, especially someone, I mean, not to steal your thunder, Chris, you'll tell your story, but, you know, their, their distillery is in an industrial park. So it has to, you know, you gotta, you gotta create that destination on that. But anyway, um, not, not to take, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sherman. Any questions for Sherman? I'm eager to get on and find where in Atlanta I can try this for the first time. So, so I'm I have a, qu- I have a, yeah, ahead, I have a question. Yeah. yeah. Hi, hi, Sherman. It's nice to meet you. That's an nice incredible setup that you that you've done for your for your company. And you're so right with respect to what's going on with the on premise, given what's going on with COVID, because everything is kind of shifted to the off premise. How do you? How did you organize the restaurants um, in Nashville, and and link up, you know, the, the customers so that they knew where to go um, to get these these drinks? How did that? How did that? How did you get that set up? That's pretty cool what you've done. Well, let me tell you, it's a heavy lift because you know working with restaurants is a is a street battle, and right. um, we don't integrate with POS systems. So what we've had to do is leverage the connections of uh, a collaborator in our company who actually runs an on-premise team for Mm. a distributor. So he was kind enough to tee up introductions for us as a believer in what we do. And then we subsequently baited here in Nashville and we'll beta in Dallas and we'll kind of beta in Atlanta. But everything we've done so far has been all beta work here in Nashville and it's worked fairly well, but we've had to go in literally explain, teach, train, and integrate. And it's just like when you're launching a new brand to the to the to the on-premise market. It is one establishment at a time. It's right. Right. <laughs> and especially with a new service that's driven by technology, you know, Sherman, it hasn't been done before. You know, it's so like yeah. I take my hand off to you. It's it's when you're when you're coming out of left field in an environment like this and trying to show value to a channel that really got hurt hard, you know, yeah. um, that took a lot. It takes a lot of faith and, and, and courage, you know? Well, and, and maybe not knowing what the hell I was getting into. 